All right, hey there folks. So in this video, uh, I'm gonna walk us through some of these practice questions for spectroscopy. Okay, so just as a reference, there's the formula for degree of unsaturation. Uh, remember that degree of unsaturation, if there's one, it tells us there's either one pi bond or one ring in the molecule. Uh, two degrees of unsaturation could be two pi bonds or two rings, or it could be a combination of one pi and one ring, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, in terms of the IR absorptions, we'll have some questions that give us that information. And so each of these um, different functional groups will have a very particular um, IR absorption. And here we're also seeing the shape of the different peaks. So uh, we have M for medium, S for sharp, V for variable, in other tables, you might also see W for weak um, because they're not as relevant uh, and as uh, indicative. I didn't include any of those in this particular table. Okay, and then typical proton and MR chemical shifts. Just keep in mind that as soon as we add additional, especially electron withdrawing groups, that these, these signals can shift right out of these provided ranges and that OH, NH, uh, SH um, do have variable chemical shifts. All right, so let's take a look at these. And what I suggest is for each question that we do, you pause the video, you solve it for yourself, and then you compare your answer with what we do here. Okay, so in terms of the answer, that would be A, B, and C. So here we would compare back to the chemical shift table. And so when we have uh, just a regular alkyl proton, that'll be the most shielded. So that would be just above one ppm. Protons on a carbon next to a carbonyl, if you look in the table, and they come uh, near 2 ppm. Then protons on a carbon next to an oxygen, particularly ones that are on an, an ester oxygen involved in resonance, um, come around 3.5, 3.6 ppm. They can even come as high as uh, just over 2, uh, just over 4 ppm. All right, so this question number two. Uh, Question two, so how many protons are expected? So what I recommend you do here is you draw this out. Draw all the different kinds of protons that are uh, expected. And so the final answer here is going to be four. So if we look at this, well, there's a series of methyl protons. So these protons that form part of a CH3 group, there's no other CH3s in there. So those are going to be um, unique from all the rest. There's only one set of protons that are on a carbon uh, that's right next to a chlorine atom. So they're gonna be distinct, so that's the second signal. Now, in terms of these others, they're both on carbons that are next to a carbonyl group, but on the other side, each other side is different. So the CH2, the methylene here, that's on a carbon next to a carbonyl, well, these ones are closer to the chlorine than the other CH2s. And so there's gonna be a set there. And then it's going to be a final set. So four signals in total. Okay, so what you're looking at in this particular uh, example here is a, is a problem solving method for identifying an unknown compound. So say we're in the situation, shrink that a bit, say we're in the situation where we're given the chemical formula and we need to figure out, based on the uh, NMR spectrum, the proton NMR spectrum, uh, what molecules represented by this formula, what sample was put into that spectrometer. So we start by determining the degree of unsaturation from the formula. So two times the number of carbons, plus two, plus the number of nitrogens, minus the number of hydrogens, minus the number of halogens. We ignore oxygen and sulfur, all divided by two. So I see four plus two is six, minus six. Overall, a degree of unsaturation of zero. That tells us there's no pi bonds, there's no rings. Um, every atom is fully saturated, has its maximum number of atoms. Okay, determine the number of protons under each signal using the integrals. So the integrals are these lines here. They measure the area under the peak and they tell us the relative proportion of protons that are under each signal. 
So what we do there is we literally, with a ruler, measure the heights of each of those. So in the one that I measured, I had uh, one centimeter. This one was two centimeters. And then this one is three centimeters. We add all that up, so it's six centimeters total. I know that there are six hydrogens in the formula, and that tells me that there's, for every one centimeter of integral, there's going to be one hydrogen atom. So that tells me that under this first signal, that's one centimeter in height, that signal is represented by one hydrogen, one proton, a second one, two H's, and three H's. Now it happens that the numbers match, but these, these integrals are going to give us a ratio, and so you do have to compare to the number of protons in the formula just to double check, because it could alternatively um, have been two centimeters, four centimeters, and six centimeters, but the number of protons underneath the signal would not have changed. Okay, our next step then, let's get rid of some of the mess here. Our next step is to analyze the multiplicity. We're gonna to get to that in a second, so we're actually gonna leave that one for now. Next one, we're gonna use chemical shifts as clues to put the pieces together, and then we're actually gonna put it together. All right, so this is where I'm going to copy some of this information all over. So chemical shift of signal A is around, I don't know, 4.8. This is, can be an estimate. Uh, B is about 3.6 and uh, maybe 1.1. Integration of 1H, 2Hs, and 3Hs. Multiplicity we're ignoring for now. Okay. So when we have, this is where we're going to brainstorm. We're not going to worry about being wrong. We're going to write down all our ideas, and then we're going to cross-check it with the data. Okay, so if we have an integration of 1H, that can be uh, a CH, could be an OH, could be an NH. Now this particular case, NH doesn't make sense because there's no nitrogen atoms in the formula. We can right away eliminate that, but we're not sure if it's CH or OH. Now, two H's, so now I'm down in the, with the signal B. Well, that could be two times CH groups, be two times two OH groups that are chemically equivalent to each other, um, or it could be a CH2, and it could be an NH2, but we already know there's no N. All right. I'm going to pause on that one for a second, and the 3H1, so now I'm down at signal C, that could be um, three CH groups that are all chemically equivalent to each other. Uh, it could be a CH and a CH2, but to have a CH and a CH2 that are chemically equivalent, mm, not so possible. Now we could have a CH and a CH2 that are in such similar chemical environments that their peaks overlap, and that certainly happens, particularly in proton NMR. But let's see what other options there are. It could also be a CH3 group. Now, knowing that we only have two protons in this entire molecule, uh, excuse me, knowing that we only have two carbons in this entire molecule, let's go with the simplest option possible, so that would be going with a CH3 for the bottom one, CH2 for the middle. We're already out of carbon atoms, we only have two to work with, so it must be an OH then for signal A. So now it is time to put the pieces together. So let's draw out the pieces that we have. These lines that I'm drawing indicate where there's room in that atom's valence to have another attachment we have an OH. Okay, so let's stick those pieces together. Double check that you have the right number of atoms in the formula, so two carbon atoms, six hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom. We have all the atoms accounted for, perfect. We're going to move these around and try to make a molecule. Now if I directly 
try to just connect the CH3 and the OH, there'd be no other room to then put the CH2 in there. So that can't be the way to do this. Okay, the only real way is to put that CH2 group in the middle. And then to rotate that bond of the OH around and put it on the end there. Okay, if we redraw that more cleanly, there's the final molecule. Okay, so let's do another. So again, I suggest that you work on this on your own, pause the video, come back when you're ready. Okay, so here what I'm seeing when I calculate the integrals again, 2H, 3H, 3H. I'm going to use the chemical shift and that chemical shift table to approximate the chemical environment of each of those protons. I'll just copy over that information before we go on. I'm going to do one more of that multiplicity before we get into it. Okay, okay so again, let's go with the simplest um, ideas possible here. So for example, this A could be two OHs or two CHs or CH2. Okay, so we're going to start by going with the simplest option possible though, see if that works out for us. Each of those two CH3s. Ah, hopefully you've caught that I missed one of the uh, first things that we should do actually, calculate the degree of unsaturation. Degree of unsaturation for this molecule is, so two times the number of carbons plus two, Minus 8 all divided by 2, so it is 1, I believe. So that tells us there's a pi bond or a ring in the molecule. Okay, let's look at what we have so far in terms of these different pieces that we can put together. So we have a CH2, we have a CH3, another CH3. Differentiate those protons. Okay. Uh, and then we're missing some atoms because we have two oxygen atoms in there. We need a pi bond or a ring. So, one thing we might think about, and this is a guess at this point because I don't have any data exactly pointing to this, but I could have a, you know, kind of an idea. It's a carbonyl group, and then maybe an oxygen. Okay. Let's start putting some stuff together. So if you didn't get this far, now's the time to try to fit a molecule together and see if you can make it match the data. Okay, so I've just Kind of without thinking too much about it, I've stuck those different fragments together. Now I'm going to imagine that I'm not looking at the actual data right now, and I'm just going to use, do my own prediction using the chemical shift table of where I expect to find each of these proton chemical shifts. So for example, this pink one at the far left, uh, excuse me, at the far right, I would expect to be around four parts per million. Those are protons on a carbon next to an oxygen that's part of an ester. So something around four. That's a problem because that proton's around two. Okay, I'd expect these yellow protons, uh, because they're next to a carbonyl and an alkyl group, to be around two ppm. And again, there's a mismatch because I know that those protons are around four. Uh, and then I expect these gray alkyl protons to be somewhere around one. And that one's okay. So we're good, but we have two problems. So what that tells me is that I put the molecule together incorrectly, so I need to switch some things up. So 
So one thing I might think of doing All right, so now I've got uh, protons A, if I make a prediction about where they should be. So they should be about four point, around four, being next to an oxygen. And that is in fact where we see them, great. Uh, protons C, we should see something around one ppm. And that is in fact where we see them, so we're good there. And proton B, uh, we should see, you know, they're next to a carbonyl, they should be somewhere around 2 ppm. That is, in fact, where we see protons B. And so that works there too. So we've made the fragments, we've put the fragments together. The first way did not match the given data. Rearrange the fragments, double check with the data, and that time it did work. So there's the molecule. Okay, so let's get into coupling. It's also called multiplicity, it's also called splitting. Okay, there's a, there's a theory video on this. We're gonna get into the practical parts here. So it's the idea that it, the appearance of a single signal can be a singlet, a doublet. This one I've squared as a triplet. Uh, it can be as another triplet, it can be a quartet, it can be a multiplet, okay, etc. And what that tells us is the number of neighbors for these protons. So let's get into the details here. Okay, so the number of peaks actually gives us information about the number of equivalent neighbors, number of non-equivalent neighbors. So number of peaks is given by the formula N plus one where n is the number of protons neighboring the one we're looking at that are not equivalent. Number of non-equivalent neighboring protons. So if you see one peak and that's a singlet, and we know that 1 equals n plus 1, so n is 0. There are 0 neighboring protons in that case. Okay, and that peak is the single peak. A doublet. So there's one neighbor, one non-equivalent neighbor. And so a doublet looks like two lines side by side. A triplet has three lines, and the relative intensity of the peaks is one to two to one. A quartet has relative peak intensity of one to three to three to one. Okay, and so in fact, if you remember, if you know Pascal's triangle, so there's the one peak, there's the doublet, relative peak intensity one to one. Triplet is relative peak intensity one to two to one, where you add up the two on either side to get the middle, one plus zero is one, one plus one is two, one plus zero is one. Our quartet has relative peak intensity one to three to three to one, and so quintet then, is relative peak intensity of one to four to six to four to one. And so on. You can take a look at that video on the theory of coupling to, to see exactly the reasons why. 
Okay, so keeping in mind that the number of peaks in a multiplet follow what's called an n plus 1 rule. I think with the n plus 1 rule is that it's not really a rule, it's just a simplification of a much bigger kind of concept that I've explained a little bit in the in the videos, but if, if, you, if you take a more advanced NMR course, you'd see much better details about this. So, getting into the specifics here now. If we look, for example, at signal D, signal D is a triplet, which we'd represent by a T. So that means it's three peaks, and we know that we can figure out the number of non-equivalent neighbors for it by that n plus 1 rule. So the number of non-equivalent neighbors should be 2. If we look at the actual molecule, these protons D are next to the protons C, which are not the same as it. D is next to a nitrile group, whereas C is next to an ethyl group. So these are different CH2 protons. So D, essentially C, feels the magnetic field of its neighbors, proton C, and those two proton neighbors cause D to be a triplet. Two neighbors, N equals two, N plus one makes the triplet. All right, so similarly, if we look at, if we want to look at the signal for protons A, we would look next to it. See its neighbors B. There are two neighbors, so n equals two. Two plus one is three. So we expect protons A to be a triplet. And in fact, that's exactly what we see. So proton, the signal for protons A, which are the most shielded of all the signals here, they're represented by a triplet, and they also integrate. These numbers down here represent the integrals, the integration. Okay, notice it also integrates for about three. Okay, so those are our protons A with two neighbors. Okay, next one's protons B. Okay, so if we look at the signal for protons B, and B next to it has, whoops, has three H's and has two H's, so N equals five with the total of three and two, five plus one, Is six, so we expect the signal for B to be a sextet. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. The neat thing is that if we we can use this to explain the spectrum, but we can also use it in reverse if we don't actually know what the molecule is. So say we were just looking at signal signal A, and we see that signal A is a triplet. We're trying to figure out what the structure of this molecule is. Think, okay, well, if it's a triplet, those three, it must have then, by the n plus one rule, two neighbors. So right away we know that A, which integrates for three protons, so A is a CH3, we know it integrates for three, by the n plus one rule, we know that it has to be next to two protons. So that's one of the ways that we can either use this multiplicity in the forward direction to explain peaks, or we can use it in the reverse direction to understand, to predict what neighbors are going to be. So let's do some practice. Here we're gonna predict the multiplicity of each signal. Okay, so that's CH3 group. So try to do it on your own first. It's next to a CH2, so N is two. 2 plus 1 equals 3, so that CH3 is going to be a triplet.
Okay, for the CH2, n equals 3. 3 plus 1 equals 4. So that CH2 is going to be a quartet. Okay, 1 to 2 to 1 relative intensity and 1 to 3 to 3 to 1 relative intensity. Okay, a little new thing that I introduce here. Heteroatoms tend to block coupling or prevent coupling to other neighbors. Heteroatoms. And that's in the most simplistic of NMR kind of experiments. We can actually do far more advanced NMR experiments that, that do show coupling past heteroatoms. But in the simple NMR experiments, we don't see the coupling. And so the, that means that this CH2 group, because there's an O blocking on the left and no protons on the right, that CH2 group is going to have zero neighbors. Zero plus one is one. And so that peak is going to be a singlet. We would see a single peak for that CH2 that integrates for two H's. Okay, so if we look at the other CH2 then, so it has the three protons next to it, but again, that oxygen atom blocks any further coupling, so just the three. Three plus one is four, and so it's going to be a quartet. One to three to three to one relative peak intensity, and it's going to integrate also for 2H. So in that spectrum, we would have a quartet that integrates for two protons, and we would have a singlet that integrates for two protons. Okay, then we'd have a methyl group that was a triplet, and again, you can figure out the reasons why. Okay. Sometimes the isopropyl group mixes people up a bit, so I'm going to cover this one. So let's look at that proton in the middle. It's going to integrate for 1H. In terms of number of non-equivalent neighbors, it's got the 3 and 3 more. So it's got 6 neighbors. 6 plus 1 is 7, so it's going to be a septet. Often Five and up kind of peaks are, are hard to discern, they're hard to see in the spectrum, so often we do, we just call this a multiplet. Okay, so it would be a little tiny peak with lots of bumps to it. Okay, so then let's look. Now these protons, the two methyl protons, are chemically equivalent to each other. They're both on a carbon next to a CH, so they would be the same, they would come at the, the same chemical shift. They would integrate in total for six H's, so the integral line would integrate for six H's. In terms of non number of non-equivalent neighbors, they have that one proton, so n equals one. One plus one is two, so that signal is going to be a doublet. So we'd have a pretty big doublet that integrates for six protons. Okay, in terms of the heteroatoms, again, remember that they tend to block coupling. It's not always the case, but it, it often happens. And one of the things that happens with these, with acidic protons, so protons on heteroatoms especially, is that they start to um, do acid-base reactions with solvent molecules, and that proton actually ends up coming on and off that oxygen atom, those quick acid-base reactions, comes on and off so fast that the NMR spectrometer almost gets a blurry image of it. And so it can it can either detect it or it detects it kind of as a rounded peak because it has all these variable chemical shifts. Sometimes with the proton really boundly, really tightly bound to the oxygen, sometimes with a longer bond, sometimes really even longer. That all gives different chemical shifts. But it also means that the coupling that can be detected with the other protons is either not seen or barely detectable. 
So often what that means is that it essentially has zero neighbors and so it shows up as a singlet. And because of all that exchange with the solvent and all these kind of very slightly variable uh, bond lengths and chemical environments, it's often going to be a broad singlet. So it'll look kind of like that. And it'll integrate for 1H or sometimes even less than 1H, one proton. If some of those are exchanging so fast with the solvent that it's hard to even detect. Okay, the CH2 is going to integrate for two hydrogens in terms of number of neighbors. Probably, again, won't see the coupling with the acidic proton. So probably would just have N equals 3. 3 plus 1 is 4. So we'd expect that to be a quartet that integrates for two protons. And then the last one integrates for three H's because it's three chemically equivalent protons. Number of non-equivalent neighbors is 2. Plus one is three, so we expect that to be a triplet that integrates for three protons. All right, so now we're going to get into some unknowns. So we're going to use the infrared information, and we're going to use NMR information. So remember to ignore the fingerprint region. This area just under 3,000 is the sp3 hybridized CHs. Most molecules have those, and so it's not particularly important or useful information to us. The thing that is important here is that, that peak 1759, uh, which indicates a carbonyl proton to us here. Okay, other thing to think about, degree of unsaturation. So we have 2 times 5 plus 2 minus 10 uh, all over 2, and that's 1. So 1 pi bond or 1 ring. We can already see, though, that we've got that carbonyl group. So that one degree of unsaturation is attributed to the carbonyl group. OK, so let's copy over some of that information. Um, you can use uh, you can use the instructions on how to calculate integrals to figure out the ratios here. I'm just going to fill it right in. Pause at any time to try to figure this out on your own. It's way better for you to try first, figure out where you get stuck, and then see the answer. So in terms of the multiplicity, that signal A is a singlet one peak, which means it has no neighboring, uh, no non-equivalent neighboring protons. B is a triplet, which means n equals two. So two non-equivalent neighboring protons. Maybe it's next to a CH2. Uh, we're going to put M for C as a multiplet, and so n equals number of non-equivalent protons. Neighboring protons is many. Another triplet, n equals two. So we'll assume here probably that A is a CH3, we've got a CH2, another CH2, a CH3. Okay, we need to remember that we have that carbonyl group as identified by the infrared spectrum. And we want to double check at this point that we have all the atoms accounted for. So, so far we've accounted for one, two, three, four, and five carbon atoms. So that's everything for carbon. All the protons, all 10 protons are accounted for. We've only accounted though for one out of the two oxygen atoms. So somewhere in there, there's another oxygen atom. Okay. So let's try pick, fitting those pieces together. So maybe it's an ester, pretty common functional group. We might have tried something different to start. Okay, so as I think about this, this methyl group, 
uh, on an oxygen atom makes sense for it to have a to be the most de-shielded in there. Um, we need a triplet near 2.3, so that could be this one fits for being next to a carbonyl group. In order to be a, a triplet with n equals 2, it needs to be next to a CH2. So it would make sense then to put it next to this one. And that only leaves us one more thing. Again, let's put that in there. Okay, so let's look, double check with the data before we decide that this is the right answer. All right, so that first methyl that I've highlighted in yellow here, hopefully it's going to be signal A. It should be a singlet, and that makes sense. It's next to an oxygen atom, so there's no non-equivalent proton neighbors. Fine, so that's a sing singlet with no non-equivalent neighbors. Great, chemical shift, we already said fit, so that one works. We know there's a carbonyl that was based on the IR data. The ox other oxygen came from the formula. CH2, which we hope is B, it has two non-equivalent proton neighbors. So 2 plus 1 is 3 is a triplet. Triplet, so that fits. Chemical shift fits at about just over 2. C now, so it has 2 and 3, so 5, N equals 5. We expect then it to have 6 peaks or many peaks, and that is what we see in the table. So it's integrates for two protons, many peaks uh, at about 1.6, that's around alkyl groups, not too de-shielded, so that all fits. And then finally we have D, um, alkyl proton. Uh, we know that it's a triplet, so N equals two, next to two non-equivalent proton neighbors, so that one fits as well. So all the data fits with what we've drawn. There we go.